Good morning and welcome all of you. Uh, welcome to this National uh, Science Day lecture. Uh, as the member of uh, TIFR and the secretary of the TIFR Alumni Association, I welcome you all. And uh, staying connected with the association where one uh, when I spend the most of the product years of one's life, uh, there is a feeling that uh, we human beings desire. Alumni Association is one of the best ways to do this. And apart from organizing events such as lectures, the TI for Alumni Association has also been arranging events like GS50 uh, in 2019, landmarks at 75 in uh, last year, uh, a few months back. GS50, an event to commemorate 50 years of graduate school of physics, was held in November 2019 and saw participation by quite a few of our past and current members. Similarly, landmarks at 75 uh, held about two months ago to commemorate ma major milestones of TIFR in the last 75 years and also saw good participation from all, both current members and the our past alumni. So these events bring a sense of joy and pride to uh, us all. And it is managed by the committee of comprising of both current and former members uh, who are all working on a voluntary basis uh, for further cause of TIFR. And their efforts have been quite remarkable uh, from the newsletter available on their website. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, they be we began with less than 50 members about 12, 22 years ago. And now today the membership has crossed uh, more than 800. Now, uh, this is a very big step. However, uh, much needs to be done for an organization that is 75 plus uh, year old. And the strength of the alumni association should have been more than this, but I'm sure that the alumni executive committee's uh, efforts will bear fruit in the coming years. So now on the behalf of TIFR, its entire community, uh, TA members, I extend my greetings to all of you and uh, uh, we'll work together. And now I request uh, our director, Professor Jairam Chenglu to say a few words. Please. Yeah, so um, good morning and welcome. I, I really don't have a whole, a whole lot to say. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all for this lecture on the occasion of the National uh, Science Day, Organized uh, the lecture being organized by the TFR Alumni Association. And as we just heard, um, the TAA is very, very active in ensuring that TIFR keeps in touch with its alumni, you know, organizing lectures like this, which are of wide interest to the community. And I think this is really, you know, an ideal way for us and the alumni to sort of continue to keep uh, our relationship going. And I think today it's also a good opportunity for me to express uh, my gratitude to the TAA for its very, very active involvement and its very steadfast advocacy of TIFR. I think uh, we benefited a lot from that. And I'd like to thank particularly, you know, the, the executive committee members, uh, current and past, uh, for all of the efforts that they've put in. 
So today's lecture is on the logical foundations of computer science uh, from one of our very distinguished um, alumni from the School of Technology and Computer Science, Professor Paritosh Pandya. I'm sure we'll have a proper introduction of him shortly. And, you know, just from the title of the lecture, I'm sure it's going to be a very fascinating exploration, and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chingulur, for those kind words. And now I request uh, Professor, from, Professor uh, Pranab Sen from the School of uh, Computer Science to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Pro Professor Pranab Sen. So it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Professor Taritosh Pandya. So I know him from 1994, actually. So he was my teacher. He's uh, taught me the mathematical logic course in, in my very first semester here. I've also uh, done some other courses in Automata from him. He's a great teacher, uh, great human being, a great person for advice, a great mentor to have around. So it, uh, it's a splendid honor for me. So first, uh, the formalities, uh, there are new faces here. So Professor Paritosh Pandya has been at TFR for a long time, I think 33 years, as the profile mentions. Uh, he actually uh, did his PhD from uh, TFR, I think passed out in 88, 89, something, 88, yeah. And um, then uh, shortly after that, uh, he joined as faculty. So in between, he had done an Oxford, uh, he had done a postdoc under a very noted computer scientist, Professor C.A.R. Hoare at uh, Oxford. And uh, I mean, he, uh, he regales us with stories about his Oxford days. And I remember the very first day I went to uh, the, I think it was called uh, the computer science group or something. We're part of the School of Physics then. And he gave me a short uh, profile of uh, the faculty members, especially the young faculty members. And I mean, he, he told me about himself, about uh, Professor Jay Kumar, who is not here. It was very, uh, uh, very cordial, very inspiring. Okay. So, uh, Professor Paritosh Pandya, well, uh, uh, he has had some uh, uh, great research under his credit. I, I'm sure you've seen the profile. Maybe the best testament to uh, his uh, work at TIFR and to TIFR Science in general is this Test of Time. 2020 IEEE Test of Time Award. There's actually authored by two TFR people, uh, Paritosh Pandey and there was Professor John Mathai in those days. Oh, I didn't say. Okay, namaste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a great person. Yeah. So that's. Sorry. So, so yeah, there you are. I mean, testament to the quality of work done at TFR. And uh, Paritosh's interests uh, lie outside computer science also. He is. Uh, he is very good in Hindustani vocal. He has a deep interest in music, and there was a side project which he had called uh, Mu M, I think. So this is uh, analyzing and composing Hindustani classical music on the computer, and uh, he worked uh, on it on his own for a long time. And I remember some great demonstrations he gave: the synthesized music uh, together, synthesized tabla and then synthesis music with a real tabla, but there was still a lot of difference, but it, it was a commendable effort. I mean, if you did not hear one after the other, maybe you, you would get fooled. And um, then uh, uh, straying outside pure theory, he has built a tool for formal verification, DC valid, if I remember, again, entirely on his own. So yeah, uh, I think that's all that I have to say. A very inspiring person. A great uh, expositor, so I'm sure we'll be uh, we uh, we'll all be very pleased and happy to hear what he has to say. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you, Professor Pranab Sen, for such a nice and very kind introduction. And uh, uh, even I can tell you, when I was a student that time, also we used to have a lot of interaction with Professor Pandya. Although I'm, I was from physics school and he was from the computer science school, and that music uh, he always demonstrated. It was a great pleasure, uh, where, uh, you know, seeing that thing play, computer play those things, and also the speech uh, uh, related things. So now I request uh, Professor Pandya to uh, give this lecture. Thank you, sir.
Uh, thank you, Pranab. Thank you, Director, for those very kind words. Uh, I don't know if I can live up to that. Uh, but it is indeed a, a personal pleasure and privilege to be here today to address all of you uh, on this National Science Day. You know, I, as was mentioned, I've spent 33 years of my working life in this institute, and it's like coming back at home. So, so thank you, Alumni Association, for inviting me here. Uh, uh, when I was asked to speak on this National Science Day, I thought I'll, I'll you know, I've, I've usually been on that side of the, the public lectures and, uh, you know, uh, usually it's about things I like but don't know, you know, physics and uh, mathematics occasionally. And today I thought you should have that experience. You should know about things that hopefully you like, but you may not be that familiar with. You know, computer science is one of those new sciences and you know, I want to talk about some foundational ideas about it. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, okay, it said uh, some of the slides you may have seen before, the beginning one or two, but then we will digress. So it is said that we are uh, living in the knowledge era. There is an information revolution going on. Revolutions have changed, uh, uh, have been very disruptive. They've changed the way in societies function. And now we are in this uh, information revolution. And the backbone of that revolution are, are digital technologies, digital computers, and uh, uh, communication and their convergence, right? And with, with this, new spheres of human uh, society are coming under the purview of these technologies. So, you know, we have e-commerce, lot of commerce is done today over internet. We buy things on, uh, um, you know, uh, on internet. We, we pay our taxes on internet. You know, a lot of governance is done there. The vision is that internet of things is coming. So not only will internet connect people, but it will start connecting gadgets. Gadgets will all acquire internet addresses. They will start talking to each other. They will have some local intelligence. They will have autonomy in, in making decisions. And uh, the size of the internet will grow maybe hundredfold. Okay. Along with that, there are areas like robotics, uh, data science and artificial intelligence is adding new capabilities to computing systems. The problems not traditionally handled by computing uh, uh, devices and applications are now being, uh, uh, you know, uh, attempted. And the outcome of all this is everything is getting smart. Cities are smart, going to be smart. Health is smart. What does it mean to have health smart? There will be all kinds of devices continuously sensing what you are doing you know, connected to your healthcare providers, uh, you know, there will be demographic studies of how the population as a whole, uh, you know, is doing health-wise, all kinds of things will happen. Similarly, you know, so you have smart energy and smart transport and whatnot. And, you know, digital, digital technology is going to intervene into all aspects of human functioning in the society. And this digital uh, technology, will uh, make some autonomous decisions on our, our part. They will mediate in the way in which we interact with each other and with the functioning of the society. So it's important that we understand the functioning of this device. This is really a revolution and it's changing the way people behave. So as a result, you know, we need to understand the principles by which such systems are built, they are organized, they are analyzed. And that subject is called computer science. So I think in the current era, that is a subject worthy of study. Okay. Uh, okay. It's hard to really summarize all of computer science into neat two or three baskets. But if I look very broadly, here is an attempt that it consists of algorithms, you know, which are step by step solution methods, you know, to solve problems. We'll see a, a small example there. And these algorithms are written in you know, in some notation. You can think of that as a programming language. 
and model of computation defines the language in which you can articulate your algorithm and also machines by which you can execute those programs you know okay so uh, uh, algorithm is like a circuit you build and model of computation is like laws of circuits you know by which you can actually analyze what the circuit diagram actually will 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 perform and finally there are application areas where you know uh, domain specific algorithms domain specific analysis application of these algorithms will be built uh, so two noteworthy areas of uh, you know which are hot today are ai cryptography and there are many more okay to to say a little more uh, let me briefly talk about algorithms so algorithm is a step by step method to calculate answer to a problem you know uh, you have a problem and you give an instance of the problem and then you calculate answer and here is the euclid's gcd algorithm uh, slightly massaged because the original algorithm used only subtraction you know here i have folded repeated subtraction into the uh, remainder operation modulo uh, division okay so and uh I, we will go into this function here but this function gcd when given two numbers a and b we'll try to compute the gcd and if these numbers are simple enough if b is equal to 0 then you know the answer if you don't know the answer you know you reduce the problem of finding gcd of a and b to finding recursively gcd of smaller instance of the problem that is number b and a smaller number a, a remainder of uh, a divided by b okay and you can recurse this way and this recursion is one of the typical ways in which we compute okay uh, the idea of algorithm actually comes from the name of this uh, uh, arabic i think uzbek uh, uh, polymath called al khwazmi he wrote two books which were very popular in europe one is called kitab al hisab al hindi translated book of indian computation because indian arithmetic tradition was very computational the positional number system to compute fast and that is what he wrote about you know all the computer and the other one was algebra you know popularizing algebra compendium of book of calculation by completion and balancing that included an algorithm to solve quadratics okay and uh, after him we have named, and these are really calculational methods you follow step by step method of calculation and you get answer to your problem okay i uh, algorithms is a vast science you know there are many strategies by which you can design algorithms there are principles by which you can analyze algorithms and there are people in the audience who are much more qualified to talk about it so i will talk much more about this but you definitely need to find out about algorithms their analysis and you know there are foundational questions there you know what kind of mechanism or what kind of strategies would give you how how efficient a computation okay uh the other part of computation is what i call as models of computation and you can think of that roughly as you know in modern terms programming languages plus the computers on which you run those programs okay and model of computation specifies the programming notation and its mechanical execution you know if any program is written in that that notation how do you execute that right the behavior of that program when being executed is specified and you know mathematicians logicians very about such models of computations much before computers were built so i'm going to talk about two you know mathematical uh, models of computation they arose much before computers came but they were systems for computation and one of them is uh, what is called godel's mu recursive function okay and it relies on making recursive definition of computations so if you were to calculate the fibonacci series an nth element of the fibonacci number you can uh, sort of formulate it recursively like that fibonacci the first fibonacci number is 1 second fibonacci number is 1 and n plus 2th fibonacci number is the sum of n plus previous two fibonacci numbers right that is a kind of recursive formulation of the fibonacci this was known to humanity long ago so humanity had been thinking about calculations computations long ago so there are, there are traces of you know such fibonacci sequence like calculations in greek egypt sanskrit uh, literature you know going back to 700 bc i can give references if you like uh we saw one example of uh, a recursive computation in gcd where in calculating G gcd of two numbers a and b 
we first invoke the function which would cal calculate remainder of u divided by b kind of modular arithmetic uh, and we had recursive computation of gcd of ab in terms of gcd of b and a modulo b okay so such recursive way of thinking is very very powerful and hallmark of computational algorithms in fact if you read a book called godel asher back you know it gives delightful examples of uses of recursion in various spheres of human uh, thinking and even in art you know asher's painting will show some recursive structure music will have recursion you know uh, 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 and recursion is a very so simple repetitive calculations is what you are trying to do and that is what somehow gives you power to do extremely intricate and complicated things that is how you build the model so all this idea of recursion you know has been folded up into a a, a a certain pattern of recursion which is fairly general i will not go into it but it's called primitive recursion defined by two logicians dedekind and skolem and uh, lots of functions you know in number theory you know arithmetic can be formulated as primitive functions they include you know you start with successor and by recursive definition you can do addition and by recursively doing addition you can do multiplication and then you can do power you can define primes and you can define prime factorization and you can you know go very fast you can define radical in fact it's very hard to come up with interesting functions which are not primitive recursive so here was a very very powerful system for defining functions on natural numbers right primitive recursion and it's logicians who give us that's and at the same time computable because you just followed the pattern of recursion and you could calculate the answer so it was track computational system logicians were worried about the power of the mechanisms they define and one of them was maybe tomorrow another system of compu uh, computing function comes around and they can you know compute even functions which i cannot compute or even express in my system so godel was going after the notion of all computable functions over natural number right and he added to primitive recursion uh, the idea of uh, unbounded minimization or unbounded search you know he added one more operator and he defined the notion of what are called new recursive functions or general recursive functions you can look at literature and see what they are and then he conjectured that uh, this will uh, uh, actually any function which is mechanically computed there was no definition of mechanically computed but he had some intuition would be could be expressed in uh, his definition of mu recursive functions so you see absolute notion of what is computable mechanically was being attempted to be defined so good had one definition okay uh, and this work has been influential you know this kind of there is a whole theory of such recursive definitions which is called recursive function theory and around that we have built programming languages which are widely used and modern program programming like ml or haskell or python pattern of recursions they allow you to program derive much from the insight in uh, recursive function theory and you know primitive recursion can definitely be encoded into this so we have a lot of development of functional programming to schemes like that that is there is a there is a system called lambda calculus which i will not talk about which is even closer to the functional programming languages than the than this mu recursive functions okay so logic all these logicians who are defining this abstract mathematical system these ideas moved into programming languages and we started computing like that and uh, okay another model abstract model oh, by the way this arose in 31 there were no computers there okay there were a few calculator like devices you know they could do multiplication division of some fixed numbers that you there were no computers and uh, 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 so godel just thought of this on his own for paper and pen computation a very prominent computation mathematical model of computation was defined by turing which get, gets his name called uh, turing machines this work he did much before he did his phd you know when uh, i think he was a masters student at cambridge and uh, uh, turing is said to be one of the all time greats in computer science you know he was called the first computer scientist by somebody yeah, these are exaggerated but, but truly outstanding contributions and among his most prominent works is this work on turing machines right 
So what did he do? He defined a very simple, simple device called Turing machine. What was it? It had a it had a long tape like a tape recorder, and that tape there was a tape head. You know, tape was divided into cells, and the tape head would be reading the symbol under the current tape head. So a uh, tape could only record one of a finitely many symbols, say symbols of English alphabet A to Z. Okay. And what the machine would do is it would have a finite number of states in it, you know, built out of some finite number of flip flops, if you like, or some mechanical way of configuring. And based on the current state in which it is there, and based on the symbol that it reads, you know, there would be a simple instruction which will say, in this state, reading on this symbol, this is the action you do. What is the action? You can change the symbol under the head, you know, you can record instead of the existing symbol, a new symbol, which is defined in your action. Okay, you can change your state and you can move oneself to the left or right. So it's a very simple mechanical tape recorder like system of computing. And he said, This is my machine. Okay, I just build those finite state automata and the action rules, you know, which is just a finite table. And my machine will work, you know, wandering around the tape, writing things, reading things from the tape, writing things on the tape. The initial input pro to the problem will be given on the tape and I'll write down the result on the tape. This is what he did. So among many systems of mathematical computation, this was utterly mechanical. And it is believed that this is closest to the machines. You know, we can accept it as certainly something that is mechanizable. Okay. Uh, barring this infinite or unbounded tape that you may use. Okay. Uh, next, he proved that this simple device that he had was not so powerless. You know, many other advanced mechanisms for computation that you could think of, you could mimic using this simple machine by performing a sequence of simple states. Okay. So if you built a machine, you know, which had more complex uh, mechanisms, it doesn't matter. Turing machine will be able to do the same by mimicking those steps. So his definition was robust against many, many other systems of computation. In fact, it can be shown that Gordon's new recursive functions, you know, whatever computation it does recursively, can all be using machines. That, that reduction has been shown. I gave a lecture on that in the automata course last year here. So, yes. So, machine is robust, right? And, uh, you know, very highly complex mechanisms could all be simulated like, uh, you know, primitive recursion and, you know, uh, unbounded minimization, all of those could be done here. And in fact, going from that, there is this chart Turing thesis, which is any system of computation, mechanical computation that you have or will come up with, huh, will all be simulated by, or by the, this simple Turing machine by performing sequences of simple steps. Okay. And for this, there is no proof. You know, you cannot, you have not seen the machines which will come in future. Turing gave a very convincing philosophical algorithm that, you know, if it's a mechanical device, in one of finitely many configurations, if it is reading a can distinguish only between finitely many letters. So he gave a kind of philosophical argument which is very convincing that any mechanism can be, you know, computational mechanism can be simulated by Turing machines. And that makes Turing machine an all powerful computing definition, right? Of course, you know, for every problem, you have to define a new Turing machine. Like you will build a different circuit for building, you know, for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, different functions. So you would have one Turing machine to calculate signs of a number written on the tape, another one to calculate logs, third to calculate trajectory of uh, planets, you know, I mean, these would all be special purpose computers dedicated to the problem that you have. But there was this idea that we could have general purpose computers. And the idea came with Babbage, you know. He said that the computer program itself could be reprogrammable. It could be reconfigurable. And you could give it as a para input, you know, what computation you wanted to do, you know, as a program. Okay. So the input to your, uh, uh, to your computer now is a program as well as the data uh, you know, the, the, on which that the function denoted by the program is to be computed. And there could be a computer which will try to mimic that program, you know, uh, this thing. And how do you give the program to, to another uh, uh, program? In Turing's case, he said, 
I can give a Turing machine to another Turing machine to mimic. Okay, and that is, but this idea is utterly familiar to us. You know, we buy a general purpose computer, you know, a laptop made by Intel, and then we download programs and we give program and data to them and they execute, right? So, and Intel is a kind of universal computer. You know, you can take any program and any data and start computing like that. But much before any computer were built and, you know, uh, laptops came out, the idea of Turing machine as a uni uh, universal computing device came out. That is, he designed one Turing machine called universal Turing machine, which will take description of the Turing machine, you know, the code of the Turing machine or the program corresponding to another Turing machine as, yeah, as input on the tape, as well as the data on which that, you know, our, our, our encoded Turing machine is supposed to operate and it will be used to, to behave like this. So he had this idea of universal Turing machine. Okay, and we use that all the time. You can see its, its impact on today's computers. And then using this idea and using diagonalization, I will not do this. Turing went on to argue that, you know, there are problems which cannot be solved using computers. There are limits to computation. In fact, Hilbert had set up a problem saying that first order logic, you should be able to solve mechanically, you know, you should be able to derive, you know, true facts of first order logic mechanically or to find out whether a fact is true, you know, in, in first order logic, value into first order logic, we'll see some of that. And Turing showed that that problem cannot be solved by any, his, his Turing machine, which is all powerful. So by any computation theory. So he, he really made landmark, you know, uh, uh, results about computation much before any computers were built. Okay. And again, a logician. At the same time, while these mathematical systems of computation was being invented, there were physical computing devices being built. You know, for example, Leibniz built something, you know, same guy who gave, I, I was promised there were a few students here. So Leibniz is a guy who gave you calculus independently and simultaneously with new, Newton. And he built a calculating machine. He was deeply interested in logic. Before he started working on calculus, he was, he was really enamored with logic. Okay. And he built a machine called step reckoner, which could do decimal addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and all using gears, you know, which would take one of the 10 positions. And there are models of this available on internet. So you can look at it. Babbage built the, uh, had this idea of stored program computer called analytical engine. He did the full design, but it couldn't be manufactured. The manufacturing technology of that day just could not have built something with precision then. But it was a stored program computer. But he he had no idea about what was its power. Yes, it could be reconfigured, but what could be done with it? What what is its computational power? You know, is left to logician like Turing to analyze. Uh, all these were working with gears and in decimal number system. Shannon, you know, was an information theorist. He says everything is information will be cast in bits, and you can compute with bits, right? And bits are very good for computation because, you know, you can build fast electromechanical switches which will reliably switch between states true and false, zero and one. And so you can get extremely fast and uh, reliable computation. So he, he said that, you know, Boolean reasoning can be done using digital circuits. And that idea took root. And people started building computers, you know, in which will work in binary number system using electromechanical circuits. Okay. And finally, there was, there was, there's a long history on how computational devices, you know, evolved. But the idea that one was what was called the von Neumann architecture, right? And uh, what was that architecture? The purpose of von Neumann architecture was to give a computer which will execute a machine program. Okay. Machine language program is a sequence of machine instructions. Okay. And both, like Turing state, both the machine uh, computer has a memory and then a processing unit. Okay. And the, both the machine, the program and the data. Program is on the left hand side, those two left green arrows. The data is on the right hand side. Both the program, which is a sequence of instructions, and the data would reside in the computer memory, okay? You would execute the machine language program by executing one instruction at a time, cycling between the instructions, right? And each instruction would be something simple. You know, it would say, bring me data at memory location 1000, bring me another uh, data at location 1001, 
add them up and store the result back into location 2002 you know something like that that would be one machine instruction and many machine instruction and then you know if you are executing that instruction the instruction would also tell you when is the next instruction to be executed you know at which memory location in the program which is stored in the memory is it residing and you know by default it will be the next instruction so this how this von Neumann architecture computer work this you know it would know what is the, the the current instruction to be executed by a register called program counter you fetch the instruction you decode what it is supposed to do fetch the data which is required to execute that instruction all the operand required for this perform that simple arithmetic or logical operation that you are supposed to do and write back the result change the program counter to the next instruction and cycle to this repeated fetch uh, decode execute cycle uh, repeatedly okay and that is the machine and you could use different programs and different data into the memory and it would function and that is the von neumann architecture now very simply i am going fast since then there has been much uh, and several this is the idea that took root there's a variant of this called the berkeley architecture which is closer to what was built and there was a series of computers which were built mathai Matthai Joseph was my PhD supervisor. He truly honored he is here. He did his PhD, you know, with Morris Wilkes, who designed some of these early machines, Cambridge. And I remember he gave me a part of one of those machines. I have unfortunately, when I went to Oxford, I gave it to somebody and it's lost. It would have been history. So Matthai can tell you stories from early days of building computers. Okay, several computers were built and there were some ideas around von Neumann architecture. And I didn't know you putting the first, India's first digital computer, TIFRAC, in this, which was also around von Neumann architecture and built around 61, right? Now, there has been much advance in this computational, uh, you know, uh, this computer that we use, you know, we, we have now processors which have multiple processors. You know which can do multiple instructions we have got instruction pipelining and we have got you know branch prediction we have got uh, parallel execution of instructions uh, processors have got very 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 powerful and many many uh, optimizations are used to speed up execution of machine but at heart even today's computers remain you know at some abstract level von neumann so this is the architecture which has lasted from those days till today okay and this architecture also was strongly influenced by Turing, you know, it, it had stored programs, you know, both program and data resided in memory, you had this one model, you know, one universal program, and it was Turing complete, anything that could be done by Turing machine could be done by this machine. So it was also, in principle, as powerful as, uh, you know, any computational device. So you can see the influence of, you know, logicians on this. Okay, so they are all over. In fact, Vardy, you know, Moshe Vardy is one of the big thinkers in logic and computer science today. He has this delightful talk on YouTube which said how logic, logic begot computer science when giants ruled the earth. So, you know, being from Israel to talk about Nephilim and, you know, giants are all here, of course. But there is some truth in that. It was really through the logicians that we owe the conceptual ideas around which this whole notion of computation is built. This is one part of how logic influences computer science. Uh, we have not stayed there. Those machine programs are really tedious and low level to write. And people have built very advanced programming systems by which you can write programming recipes. You know, in particular, what is the function is much higher level than, than, than your machine programs of von Neumann machines. And nowadays, we have very rich high level programming languages in which we write algorithms. You know, we have C, C++, Java, Haskell, Python, body within them, highly sophisticated models of computation, structured programming, object-oriented programming. I won't go too much into these models of computation. But due to Turing's idea that more complex mechanisms can be simulated by sim simpler mechanisms, that idea of simulation is built from compiler. It takes these high level programs with very sophisticated models of computation and translates it into a machine program, which is equivalent, which is functionally equivalent to the other program. So we all use compilers. And again, roots of these ideas, you know, go back to theory of computation. 
Okay. Uh, so a compiler translates Havilah into functional language machine program. And uh, this is the status of computing, models of computing today. There is a lot more that could be said in detail, but at an overview level, this is where I would like to stop about this. And we saw how many logicians and they're thinking about what is computation influence these models, right? But let's talk about logic per se, you know? Uh, so I will change track and now over to logic. Uh, you know, nowadays we have artificial intelligence and you know, it does, it, it, you know, we build translation systems using it. They are supposed to be faithful and we have, uh, you know, they give answers to stories, you know, they do common sense reasoning and it's magical. It's supposed to do everything. We don't need any other branch of knowledge, you know, is the impression in the popular mind. Okay. So there is this uh, new toy on the market called chat GPT. And uh, my colleague, Professor Abhiram Ranade, you know, started playing with it. And he gave it this question, and this is the response produced by it. Okay. So it says, so my, my question is, is Chappity a, a reasoning system? And what it says is, if one right angle triangle is 43 degrees, what, is, what angle of the triangle is smallest? Okay, that is what. And chat GPT is very good. You know, he said smallest angle in right angle is always the one opposite the shortest side, which is other than side next to the perpendicular, uh, uh, which is next to the perpendicular, uh, the 90 degree angle, right? And then he says, in this case, since triangle is one angle of 43, smallest angle must be complement. So he knows that apart from 90 degree, the two angles are complement. And then he concludes the smallest angle is 47 degrees. Pardon? I don't know how chat GPT works. You know, I have no idea how chat GPT, but, but it will do these things. So I think it is abundantly clear that it is not doing logical reasoning. It is doing something else. And it is built around what is called large language model. It's picking up the next uh, plausible and most probable answer among the kind of sentences See, some centers say so by one angle by the other, and you know, you get a new angle, and the middle of the new angle is the smallest angle. So put it there. You know, <laughs> you know, that's the most problem in the database. And of course, it's fascinating, but it is not really a reasoning system. The key aspect, you know, that distinguishes such kind of inferencing from logic is the notion of consistency and truth. This is paramount in logic. You must always try to come up with answers which are true. You may not be able to come up with answers, but you must not try to come up with contradictory answers. You know? Okay? So you can never say that 2 is equal to 4. You know, by the system of deductions that you name. And so logic is a framework for stating and making valid arguments. And the way you exhibit arguments is by giving proofs. And these proofs are given using simple rules of how new facts can be derived from old facts. And these rules are supposed to be sound. From true facts, you should only be able to derive true conclusions. Okay? And there are... See, Greeks had this idea and many other civilizations, but certainly in an articulated form. Greeks had this idea of rationality. They said rational thinking is the way to arrive at truth in many spheres, in ethics, in aesthetics. And they said there are there are patterns of reasoning which are universal and they will allow you to arrive at new truths from known truths okay these are these patterns of reasonings are called syllogisms that, that is what for, you know patterns of reasoning and one typical well known example is all men are mortal socrates is a mens hence socrates is mortal right and he says, this pattern of reasoning is outlined by this rule, which is written in black. I've written it in modern notation. And what it says is, for any object, x, if x has property h, which in our form could be human, you know, and then it also has property m. That is what the first line about the, about the line, the first premise about the line says that. That suppose we know that all objects which have property H also have property M. So H could be, you know, X is human, M is his mark, or H could be it is raining, and M could be the road is wet. You know, so whenever it's the road is wet. 
you know that is what you, it's a conditional statement second statement is that property which holds for some term t you know socrates is father is mortal or day before yesterday it rain you know this is my interpretation of h then you know the rule says that in that case i can also assert m for t so socrates is father is also mortal and you know day before yesterday also the road was wet right so this is syllogism and he says if rules like this allow you to infer decisions and they try to argue about ethics and aesthetics everything using rules like that for them rationality was producing proofs using such rules okay so it was a universal pattern uh, you know some sort of framework for rational reasoning and proving okay now who is interested in making such valid inferences philosophers definitely they want to arrive at truth you know truth of a political system truth of a religion truth of a uh, you know ethics truth of aesthetics you know look at plato's dialogues he has four book, parts to his book which deal with all these topics and dealt with very logically right i think buddhists had their own system of inferencing you know called nyaya navya nyaya and they put all of buddhist philosophy try to reasoning about it nagarjuna uh, had fourth century ad or something don't hold me to it you know he has cast the full the theological reasoning proving you know talking about causality and uh, you know uh, unity and all that using using logic right so uh, but mathematicians are interested in proofs they want to arrive at true facts right about mathematical objects and a classical uh, you know treatise of using logic and proof theoretic arguments to arrive at uh, you know mathematical truths is also classical you can find it in the work of euclid you know in his 13 volume book called uh, elements and you know these are all the proofs about planar geometry which we learn so there are these five postulates about lines and points and when they are parallel and you know we derive like ss if two side if you have two triangles and two sides are equal and the in between angle is equal then the two triangles are congruent you know many more we teach it in school right but everything is done exactly from let's to arrive at truth and that is the method of you know arriving at truth in mathematics the axiomatic technique okay very influential and computer scientists are interested in it because they have to arrive at you know valid conclusions about the computer programs they write right these computer programs are very complex objects they are now going to get into all aspects of human society and we we had better be sure about what they are doing and how they are functioning we had better be able to analyze them and make statements about you know their properties and one of the preferred language uh, methods to analyze them is such deductive reasoning we'll see that okay so now i am challenged here just click on the pointer yes it came okay this is fine so so okay so what do okay i take liberty here i am not a mathematician but whatever i could garner mathematicians study mathematical structure you know and a structure is uh, consists of is a three tuple consisting of the domain of values that arise in that structure uh the set of functions which operate on the elements the members of that function and a set of relationships that some elements of those those uh, domain have it's best illustrated by an example so natural number consists of the set of natural numbers i will include zero in it zero one two three going up to infinity there is a constant zero which is a natural number one of those and then there are uh, functions plus and multiply we take natural numbers and give back natural number so my ff consists of this you know things inside the first curly bracket set right and my relations you know each relation you know says that certain tuples satisfy my relationship and certain tuples of elements don't satisfy my relationship so relation is actually a set of tuples okay drawn over the elements of the domain and i have a less than relation which is a binary relation so it consists of two parts such that the first element is less than the second element right so 3 is less than 4 similarly integers consists of integers 
and uh, the uh, you know there is a function plus which now should be able to add even negative numbers to negative numbers or negative numbers to positive numbers. So if you're building digital circuits, it will work differently. You know, maybe you will use two's complement, you know, arithmetic and build the circuits to work differently. So these pluses, although they look the same, they are different. They work on different data elements. Okay. And then I cannot really give you natural numbers on a plate. You know, it's not like reality that you can experiment with in physics. You know, how do we even know what are natural numbers or what are real numbers or what are functions over real, real numbers? So, you know, the way we address these mathematical objects is by their properties. Okay. So by the predicates that we write about them. And here are some examples of the properties. So for example, we can say for some object X inside my natural number, X is less than successor of X. Successor gives me the next natural number. Okay. Successor of three is four, successor of seven is eight, etc. And I have here one property that I want to assert for for, for some number system, which says x is less than successor of x. Okay, uh, I can take several such facts and put a Boolean combination of them, conjunction of them. So this one says x is a less than successor of x, and it is not the case that x is equal to successor of x. So successor gives me something other than the argument x, right? And then we use quantifiers. So this symbol. Inverted AX pronounced for all X means for all values of variable X, some property should hold. Property like this should hold. And this symbol here is pronounced for which some property holds. So now using these are called quantifiers. And using quantifiers, we can write sentences like this for all X, X plus 0 is equal to X. Right? And this property would hold for natural numbers, integers, etc. Uh, here is another property. It says for every element of my number system, there exists x, there exists another num uh, number y whose choice depends on the choice of x, such that x plus y is equal to zero. So, you know, every number has an additive inverse, right? These are very simple properties. I think there are college students here. I apologize to TFR members, but, uh, you know, this property is true of integers, but not true of natural numbers, right? So there are properties which are kind of separate, you know, uh, mathematical structures. And the axiomatic method actually says you should try to find out the key properties of the mathematical structure that you are interested in, right? These are called self-evident non-logical truths about the structure. These are called axioms of that structure. And we work out all the essential properties. Uh, of the structure and all other properties about that mathematical structure should follow from these. Okay, so these are golden properties which 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 embody in them all the key properties of the structure. So take natural numbers. You know, here is an axiomatization of the natural number. I don't want you to read all of this, but for example, there is this this axiom which says for all x x plus zero is equal to x. Or if successor of x is equal to successor of y, then x is equal to y. Such simple truths are there. And you know, there are these six. And then this complicated thing is nothing but principle of mathematical induction that you that you know. So, and it is claimed that these are sufficient to talk about all properties of natural numbers that you know there. What do you mean by sufficient? Any property of natural numbers which is true, you should be able to somehow derive from these. There should be a proof using laws of some logic, which will allow you to, including Fermat's theorem, you know, which, which, which took, I don't know, how many, 400 years to solve. And our Kare here gave a better, better proof. And there is Kolad's uh, conjecture, which is still not solved. For all of them, 3x plus 1 modulo 2, you know, uh, for any x will go to 1 eventually when repeatedly applied. Okay, uh, so these are called axioms. And from these axioms, we have rules which allow us to derive new facts from old facts. So for I cooked up this, one is a standard uh, rule for uh, uh, or rule schema for equality. If it says x is equal to y, then for any function, you know, multiply, divide, successor, whatever, f of x is equal to f of y. Okay, so equality is a, is 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 a congruence 
you know and other one i took up for this example if p implies q q implies r then p oh this should be double arrow i write r and from this we can prove facts like this you know if x is equal to successor of y whatever those x and y are then successor of x is equal to successor of successor of y you know and what you do is first using rule 1 you instantiate this blue x by x blue y by successor of y substitute x by blue x by x blue y by successor of y and you get this right so this rule came by is instantiated as fact and logic tells you this is valid you do another instantiation and then use rule second okay this is a simple proof demonstration nothing very intricate there but you know new mathematical facts can be arrived at you know by using this rules from the existing facts okay and i have here three great logicians mathematicians the left hand side is hilbert you know who said mathematics must be done axiomatically in one liner uh, definition of his program uh, what does that mean he says mathematicians must exhibit truth of their theorems using logical proofs that is the first thing the key job of mathematician when studying a subject matter a, a mathematical structure or a class of structures is to arrive at axioms you know just as we had axioms of arithmetic there you know to arrive at the axioms of that that mathematical structure and uh, there must be you know and all other uh, you know there must be a comprehensive system of rules which will allow you to derive new facts from old facts you know the rules of logic and you should you should basically establish new facts by giving proof using the rules of logic from the axioms that you have so this is and you can follow this in giving geometric proof right uh, hilbert himself wrote a, wrote a book on geometry where he followed this method i mean while piano was following this for arithmetic you know uh, but this requires a universal language for stating all mathematical facts and hilbert said there should be such a language secondly there must be a universal system of logical rules independent of my subject matter which will allow me to deduce you know new facts out of whole so standard aristotle's idea of you know some rational reasoning using some syllogisms okay and third was uh, and this is how we we do mathematics and he po postulated three facts from uh, from uh, uh, and decidedly saunders says that using this method if you derive a fact it must be true only true facts can be derived from true axioms okay i will not go too much into detail uh, completeness says that your system is so powerful that every true fact can be derived every true true fact you know uh, can be derived and the all facts must be mechanically derivable using computers like turing machines or bodel's mu recursive function and uh, uh, frege was the logician who gave such a universal language uh, he defined the first order logic we have been seeing formulas of first order logic in those arithmetic uh, axioms etc and uh, they tried to encode it was supposed to be universal they tried to encode all known mathematics using first order logic and some simple as uh, and ideas of set theory so they would encode numbers as sets you know functions over numbers as sets you know real, uh, real analysis as set topology as set you know everything was encoded using logic and set theory and bertrand russell wrote this three volumes called principia mathematica you know, came out in 10 11 and 12 where you know using logic and set theory frege's logic and set theory they they encoded all of the known maths so you know truly hilbert's idea could could be done nowadays there are there are you know this work is partly taken up by computers there is this thing called mizar mathematical library mizar is a computer program which will check that the rules are being rules of logic are being applied correctly so it's based on first order logic and set theory and it has about a lakh theorems from mathematics you know built into it whole graduate level textbooks are put there along with all the proofs these proofs are machine checked to see that the the rules are applied uh, you know correctly and if a, a a a a theorem gets into this library you can use it for the next theorem as a lemma so you know the the work just builds 
and uh, so so you know uh, uh, this um, um, uh, hilbert and russell's program is now increasingly being taken up by computers but this system so through up a paradox called russell's paradox you see in set theory there is an ax axiom called unrestricted comprehension if you can define a set of uh, a collection of objects having some property you can collect them together and form a set out of it and anything you know so you can make self referential statements and i will not go into this a, a sentence like this time is running out is you know something like this sentence is false now if you want to try give a definite meaning to it you know whether this sentence is true or false you run into trouble you say this sentence is false is true you know then it has to be false on the other hand if you assume that this sentence is false then because this sentence is stating the thing it must be true so there is no meaningful way in which you can assign a truth value to them similarly to some statements within this frege system you know the you could not give any meaning to and the whole program ran into a, a problem of uh, uh, you know not having solid foundations frege went into depression finally russell fixed it by defining a system of types where he said that if you define a function you know from domain a to range b then a and b must be simpler types you know and function from a to b is a higher type is object than a lower type system and you can't do self reference so you build a system of building any more and more complex uh, objects but uh, which will avoid self reference this is called the ramified theory of types and uh, uh, actually is principia mathematica used that okay this idea of type systems is very much there in modern programming languages uh, it has sound sense like dimensionality analysis in physics right i mean every entity has a certain dimension we are talking about pressure it is a force per unit area so it is a newton per meter square and newton is you know a force arises by mass into acceleration so it will be kg uh, into meter per second square and you can arrive at. and then when you try to assign pressure to force you will get into dimensional problems so you can avoid a lot of mistakes just by checking the dimensionality type there is the same rule so you know every object in a computer program should have a type and when you manipulate it while the computer program executes you must somehow make sure that you are applying only those functions which give you answers of the right type so type checking you know is a very very healthy thing your program's type safety is very important there are strongly typed languages where types can be checked even before you run the program by analyzing it and this type systems are very much the flavor of logic in fact logic is what drives this design of type systems so if you look at languages like haskell or c++ or you know something like uh, coq you know it has very elaborate type system and type system is very important because uh, you know computer programs are amongst the most sophisticated uh, you know artifacts made by human kinds you know your uh, microsoft windows has got uh, 60 million lines of code or maybe even larger more than number of parts in apollo 11 how are you going to sensibly design such a complex artifact you need something that will keep you disciplined and not make mistake type systems are a key to it so another idea from logic which influence uh, this thing i'll end with this dbms 2 minutes and then i'll skip subject that is closest to my heart we have run out of time but uh, let us do this so you know relational databases you know very important uh, area relational database systems are all over you know all the e-commerce that you do you know your airlines use them your uh, e-commerce stores you know your uh, amazons and etc use them even your uh, mobile phone as a small database system and today they are all relational database systems the estimate is that uh, rdbms market that is the short form for relational database is 133 billion dollar industry at the moment at some point somebody said this is 50% of computer applications and that whole industry is driven by the ideas of what are called relational databases today those ideas came from uh, 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 an engineer scientist at ibm called cord okay and he based these ideas on logic so you know we don't have a nobel prize in computer science there is no nobel prize in maths our highest prize you know the so called nobel prize is turing award and cord went on to get his turing award in 81 this four bullets are from the citation of his turing award 
Okay, so it says uh, uh, the last three, sorry, not the first one. So it says relational model is widely recognized as one of the greatest achievements of 20th century. You know, applying his knowledge of mathematical logic, Code was able to provide a system for uh, uh, modeling data and you know uh, its manipulations. For his name will be forever associated the relational model of data. Specifically, he provided a theoretical framework in which variety of important database problems could be attacked in a scientific manner. There were principles here, and they came from logic. As a consequence, is no exaggeration so that essentially all the databases in use or under development are essentially relational. Give you 133. So I'll give you a flavor of what this database ideas and how logics come there, but massive impact. Before COD, what was happening? Database builders using models called network models, which emphasize where you know various data are lying on the hard disk. And you know, you had indices which said, if you access this record, the next record is at this location. It was all physical and you know, by links and uh, you, know, you manipulated those links and walked through those links. It was a mess. It is said in this article, that it was ad hoc and required specialists who made mistakes and the subject was a mess. In one fell swoop, God cleaned it up. Okay, so what did he do? He said, my database consists of a set of tables. You know, here is a table called person, which stores the name of the person, the gender of the person and country. So in the table, there is a row which says, you know, Amrita huh, is a female, you know, and uh, is from country UK. So it's a three tuple, you know, and each row of the table is a tuple and your table is a collection of tuples, right? This is essentially the idea of a, of a mathematical structure and a relation. A relation is a set of tuples, right? So, called so this great identity between data tables and mathematical relations. Okay, he said we can interpret a mathematical relation as coming out of a data table. This was his first first big idea. So, another we can have another table in our database which says parent, which 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 consists of tuples. You know, Parito, uh, uh, Kulin, and Paritosh. Which says Kulin is the father of Paritosh. Right, and there could be many such tuples. Right, so that is a that is a relational database, a set of tables. You know, where each table, uh, you know, has some fields or attributes. These are the columns, and uh, basically each row is a tuple. Now, you know, there are some healthiness properties, some constraints on the kind of data that a database can happen. These are called database constraints. And the most logical way of articulating that constraint is formulas of logic. For example, you know. No person can be his own parent, right? So, parent relation is irreflexive. That is, for all tuples, uh, for all x's, you know, uh, all names which exist in the tuples of my parent table, it is not the case that I have a tuple which says xx, paritosh, paritosh, or kulin, kulin. That should not happen. And that is called a database constraint. And God said the right way to articulate database constraints is by formulas of first order logic. Next, you want to pull out some useful data out of uh, the database. So, you know, one thing uh, could be, you know, uh, x is the mousy of y. Okay. Or uh, am I saying, no, x mousy is y. X is the Canada Valley aunt of Y. This is what I want to say. You know, how do I articulate? I may have reversed X and Y. Uh, please bear with me. So you can define this as a first order logic formula. You know, mousy, a tuple, you know, XY satisfies mousy XY, which is X is the Canada Valley. If, you know, there are two other names, U and V, such that V is the parent of U, V is the parent of Y also, the Y coming from here, and U and Y are distinct. So I think it may be easiest if I draw this. You have got U, V. Uh, what do I have? No, I have V here, I have Y here, and I have X here, and this is the parent relation. Right? And Y sh should be a female and should live in Canada. That is what I want, right? Because then it will be Canada Valley. And then all these arrows are parent relation. And that is what 
the first order logic is saying. There's two free variables x, y. This is defining a subset of tuples, which will exactly specify this. And so God said, if you have complex database and you want to query it, you write first order logic uh, formula, uh, formula. And that is the right query language. So he, in fact, to ease the, uh, the, the, the task of writing such things, he defined a side variant of this first order logic formula, which is called relational calculus comes in two varieties, let's not go, yeah, essentially formula like this, right? And they embody a declarative specification of the result table that should be generated by the query. It does not tell you how to go to the table and find such tuples, X and Y. In order to actually execute the query, he defined a set of algebraic operations on the tables. So, you know, these operations are select some subset of rows of the table, select some subset of columns of the table. This is called projection, selecting columns. Selecting rows is called select, uh, uh, select op, row select operation. You can take two tables and take that Cartesian product, you know, and sometimes Cartesian product with some constraints, you know, maybe two fields should match. These are called joins or products. You can take union set difference and all expressions made out of this, you know, specify an executable method of computing query. So, so, so let me give you this example. Here is a here is a table, you know, it has got four fields, ID, name, rating, and age, right, of some sailors, you know, and uh, 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 then what you are doing is you are you are you are doing the row selection here. You are saying select those rows which satisfy rating for which rating is greater than eight. And from this table, you get this, this row selection. So by applying row selection operator, further to that row selection operator, you can do a column selection operation called, called projection. So retain only the SDM and the rating column. So you get this table out of it by chaining these two operations. And so each of these is a kind of algebraic way of calculating the result, right? And there is much study of how these operations, what is the efficiency of applying these operations in a certain order when your database has certain nice properties, some normalization properties, etc. And the great uh, insight of God was, so we had this relational algebra, which was the operational definition of how data, data could be pulled out of tables. And there was this relational calculus or first order logic, which was declaratively specifying what is the kind of you know, tuples you want to generate out of that data. And what Quad showed was in his most important theorem, that first order logic, neglect the safe for this talk, uh, is equivalent to relational calculus, because it's just, which is equivalent to relational algebra. So any query that you write down in logic, you have to execute it algebraically by those sequence of operations. And any sequence such as operations, you can define what table it generates by, by an equivalent relational calculus expression. So it was a major scientific advance. You could now talk about decorelatively what you want and how you do it. Okay. And uh, this all led to the currently used query languages like structured query languages. This is useful for checking relational algebra expressions. And, uh, you know, different queries can have different powers. For example, you want to find names of all solars who have reserved a boat and your database consists of these three tables. Let's not go through the details. Then we could have two different queries, you know, giving the same result, the, the result required in group. Take, take it from me. Okay. But this one, what does it do? It takes the results table of reservations made by sailor and identifies something where the bid has got value 103 and then takes cross product of that with the sailor's name table and then it, it filters out only the names. Whereas this one first takes the cross product and then selects the rows. And this is much more efficient than this, but these two are equivalent. That equivalence can be done by going to relational calculus and doing logical equivalence. That is one of the ways. Uh, also, we can analyze the efficiency of this. So given a relational calculus, declarative query, we can try to figure out the more efficient ways of executing it. And more efficient may mean various things, you know, we have to compute less, uh, you know, smaller size tables uh, uh, during the full computation, or you could do different parts of the queries on different tables in parallel. So concurrent query execution or many such things. Okay. So the, all that was caught and it was all inspired by logic. Okay, there's a third application which I will not do at all. It is about proving programs correct. 
So you have your programs like this, you know, which take two numbers x and y, you know, integer natural numbers x and y, and you try to produce the quotient and reminder. And we write simple programs using only addition and subtraction, which will do this, and we can specify what those programs do uh, by by using logical assertions like this. You know, this is a precise articulation of what the program is supposed to do. Okay. So firstly, it only makes sense to calculate quotient and reminder if y is greater than zero and x is non-negative. Okay. And the result should satisfy this condition. So if somebody made a program, which is here and you divide six by three, it produces answer three and one, three is equal to y. So it is not satisfying the condition and there's a bug, right? So you can also correct this program and uh, give a kind of proof using laws of you know logic like deductions. So you can actually carry out proofs about correctness of programs using very much the style of logic that Hilbert proposed. These logical assertions talk about the kind of data you have in program. If your program is talking about lists, you should have a little axiomatic theory of how lists behave. It's talking about trees, you build a little theory, the, the words are from Dijkstra of trees and then use those in your logical deductions. Right? So we exonitize the data types that arise in our program execution and then we reason about it. So I will close with that and uh, uh, some proof like this could be done. But uh, these are the guys who actually talked about this axiomatic way of establishing correctness of programs, right? And seminal paper came from Bob Floyd, okay? The, the exact logical deduction form, you know, proof system form of this method came up before and uh, Dijkstra followed this method and many of us are aware of the many algorithms that Dijkstra has discovered, shortest path, minimum spanning tree. He claims to have discovered these algorithms by using this method of proofs. He tries to do the proof for the idea he has and he shortly refines his ideas and comes up with the algorithm. So very influential, but you can see the influence of Hilbert on this line of work. The very paper of Tony Hoare, it says axiomatic basis of computer programming, reminds you of Hilbert's doing mathematics axiomatically. And all three of them went on to win the Turing Award. Turing, of course, could not have won Turing Award. <laughs> okay, so they are, they are, these are these are among greats of our field. Uh, I will close with that. Uh, we have talked about how logic has influenced computer science. We can encode many computer science questions into logic. Okay, and then we can build algorithms which will solve logical questions. Is this logical formula valid? So we have theorem provers which will try to prove logical assertions from the axioms. Okay, and that is a thriving activity these days. You know, there are these theorem proofs come in various varieties. The simplest ones are just proof checkers. They just check that the rules of logic have been correctly applied, but you have to give the full proof. And Mizar is like that. Then there are the automatic theorem proofs where you give the premises and the conclusion, and you somehow search through the space of proofs and try to find out the proof completely automatically. And then there are interactive ones. That's some of the more difficult steps you do, but the simpler ones, the things done and there are many successes to this thing. There are many computer programs, you know, which are sophisticated, which have been designed and their correctness has been proved using uh, theorem proving systems. Okay. So this is a growing enterprise. And uh, uh, we have now automated tools like SAT and SMT, which automate many of these uh, uh, steps. So I think there is this intimate connection between logic and computer science. There is an area, uh, there is much use of logic in artificial intelligence, but I will completely not talk about it. There is also an area called descriptive complexity theory, you know, which tries to articulate questions like is P equal to NP, the most famous question in computer science in logical terms. You know, every NP problem can be articulated by a formula of certain logic exactly it corresponds to formula of uh, certain logic. It is existential second order logic. You know, this is Fagin's theorem. And then you ask, uh, you know, uh, you similarly there are logics which characterize P and then you ask is every sentence in, uh, in existential second logic, is there an equivalent sentence of small size in, in this? So, you know, 
I think even complexity theory can be, there are connections with logic and logic is a rich discipline. Unfortunately, we cannot analyze computer programs mathematically using classical mathematics. We don't have a Lagrangian mechanics for programs. We cannot formulate working of program as a Jacobian. We have to fall upon, you know, basic methods like logic and discrete maths. Okay. So I tried, this is the first time I'm talking about the larger picture of logic and computation. I overshot, apologize for that. But I hope you got glimpses of how logic and logicians have influenced the fields of computer science. So I think I will close with that. Thank you. Sorry for overshooting. Professor, yeah, it's such a getting shocked that uh, this great line could have just continued. Uh, mm -hmm. So now the talk is open for questions and comments. So I'll just come to. Yeah. Uh, one question regarding Aristotle and one regarding Schrodinger. Okay. So um, uh, did Aristotle think of syllogisms as self evident truths or did he give it a different status? And what do modern logicians think about? Syllogisms are valid patterns of reasoning. They will only allow you to derive two things from two things. That is what he believed. Now, that is the consistency of your underlying logical system. And there is no proof. This is a this is a question that is raised by 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 Hilbert. And first order logic was proposed by by Frege. Finally, Grodel proved consistency of first order logic. So it shows that, you know, it will never be contradictory statements, you know, okay. That is what is guaranteed. If there is the, uh, 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 there is the converse property of complete. Every true thing can also be derived in it. Completeness of first order logic was also proved by Godel's first completeness theorem. And then the second completeness theorem, uh, incompleteness theorem, he said, you know, any, Exomatization of arithmetic with some laws of logic will be weak in the sense that outside that system, you can figure out there are statements which are true, but which cannot be proved within the system. So there will be in quotes true statements which are unprovable. I mean, uh, wrecking Hilbert's program, which said we should have a logical system where every true thing can be derived. And Turing, uh, by proving undecidability of first order logic, Wreck the mechanical derivation of proofs, you know. Hilbert had this view that, you know, you discover axiom, there's this standard logics and you can leave it to secretaries to do the proofs. You know, it's a very mechanical activity. He didn't have computers then. And uh, Turing said, this is impossible. Godel said even, you know. Principle. Pardon? Godel said in principle also it is impossible. In principle, it is impossible to, uh, you know, a system which can derive every fact about this thing will be inconsistent. So uh, it's no use. And yet the method has remained. You see, just because it is incomplete doesn't mean we can't apply it. And, you know, all of Russell's work or Mizar or all of the reasoning. Uh, I must also confess that logic is not a popular discipline in, uh, in mathematics. Many other branches are. Uh, but uh, in computer science, it's a different story. You know, uh, uh, so there are papers by very famous computer scientists uh, titled The Unusual Effectiveness of Logic in Computer Science. You know, taking up upon, un uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I think they call the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in science, you know, they took this on. Uh, there is a point of variance. The field medalist Wybotsky has come back to Hilbert's ideas. He still thinks mathematics should be done using formal logic and type theory. In fact, he has propagated, proposed something called univalent type theory or homotopy type theory, and his own proofs had bugs. So he believes that you know proofs should all be checked by computers, and it is plausible that in in 10, 20 years' time, fair number of papers in mathematics could be submitted in a form that the proofs within the papers could be checked by a mechanical theorem prover. Whether it will be able to do those proofs or not, you know, is unknown. But Timothy Gower, another field medalist at Cambridge, you know, says that no, no, computers will, you know, in 100 years, they will do proofs as well as human beings. So mathematicians proof is just the final step of mathematics. You are just demonstrating to somebody else that what you are saying is not nonsense. Thinking about maths 
is very important. So Timothy Gower says in 100 years, computer programs will set conjecture, mathematical conjectures for other computer programs. And you did a project called polymath, where mathematicians come up with their own deductions and they put their facts inside an intelligent mathematical database, which will immediately work out replications of these facts on other facts and uh, up on polymath project on the, this thing. So these are big mathematicians who are saying that, you know, uh, the way ability of computer programs and theorem provers, you know, including some AI techniques behind it is growing, you know, uh, we may have uh, mathematically thinking machines. There are already a reporter of many theorems proved automatically using computer programs. The success is still sporadic, but there are a few startling examples. I didn't have do you have any comments about that Ramanujan program, which uh, was recently some few years back, it came and it actually proved a lot of Ramanujan's uh, conjectures. Oh, no, I am not so aware of it. I must that look program, it up. That, I think that program itself is called Ramanujan. Also. Ah, okay. So uh, it did give some formulas for pi, not only the ones which are given by Ramanujan, but extra ones also. Wow. There was a Conjecture called Robin's conjecture, you know, about existence of or pseudo Boolean varieties. And it was proposed in the 30s and was open. Famous logicians like Tarski and his students worked on it, remained open. Finally, a three page proof. It's not like four color theorem where you enumerate a lot of cases. You know, three page proper deductive proof was published in a mass journal and it was found by a Automatic theorem prover called EQP from Argonne National Laboratory. <laughs> okay. There are many other examples. So, who knows, you know, where we are going with. In AI, there are two traditions logicist tradition, where you cast, you know, all the aspects of reasoning in formal logical terms. So, at, at the front, you may be talking about natural language or, you know, asking questions in some natural vocabulary. At the back, you convert it all to logic and do deductions. And this is the logicist tradition. In As against that, there is this connectionist tradition where we learn facts from data and, uh, you know, uh, there are learning programs which, are, you know, like chat GPT. Which are able to make very large strides, but with no guarantees. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so you. So second. Yeah, yeah, second. So you mentioned that the Turing machine is a finite state machine. Uh, no, it's it's controlled in finite state, uh -huh. but its state is infinite. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But this finite state, which consists of uh, every symbol it has visited and every movement it has made, or is there some restriction on that? No, no. This state, you know, will usually. You, you design a Turing machine, you will say that I will have, you know, my set of states consists of three states called S1, S2, S3 for, for one specific Turing machine. So I when I design the, the Turing machine, I specify what are the finite set of states and in each state when I see a symbol, what should I do? Yeah, so my question, it's a is, table. The question is whether this st a state consists of every symbol that has been put in or no so and the state have no bearing on each other in fact there are things which say that you can just work with a binary alphabet so on tape write only zero one but then the number of states will increase or you can just work with you know very few states three states or something like three you know and and you know but using a very large alphabet and you will get an equivalent machine so there's a trade-off between number of symbols written on states and Try to store all the symbols that you visited because the code is infinite. Uh, you know, we require an infinite state machine to store all that because it's, 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 it's a state will forget things. <laughs> States visited, so symbols seem so far. No, no, no. See, all the symbols lie on the tape, which is the scratch, you know, paper that you have, and you are looking at the current symbol and doing something, and then. Yeah, Prahlad had a question. Okay. Any other uh, question from anyone? Anyone on the uh, internet who are actually attending this, please raise your hand. I think there are only four people. So, who are these? Uh, Just curious. Actually, no, don't worry. Pardon? Yeah, it, it should pop up, but I yeah. think. Uh, I think no, nobody. I, 
So uh, if there are no more questions, uh, you would like to president of TA or so I, okay. So then I'm, this is going to be very formal uh, uh, thank you speech, but uh, let us thank uh, Professor Pandya from Kabinia and uh, giving such an enlightening talk. And thank you. Thank you very much so, for your time. I, I, and uh, I, enjoyed, honor. I enjoyed bearing this talk and for this audience. So, you know, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. And 